I'm Pastor Noah Bader, and on behalf of the members of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church, I want to welcome you and your family and thank you for joining us for our online worship service this morning. Today is the third Sunday in the season known as Advent. And again, that word Advent is a word that means to come near or to arrive. And so it's during the month of December that we prepare to welcome our Lord's arrival. Yes, we prepare to celebrate his first arrival as that small baby in Bethlehem, but we also look ahead as we seek to prepare ourselves to welcome the Lord when he returns on that last day in judgment. And to do that, we've been making our way through this series that we're calling The Promise. It's a series that is rooted in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and it's there that we encounter a number of promises that the Lord makes to his people. And the promise that we will hear the Lord make to us today is that when he comes, he comes to bring freedom. Freedom from sin and guilt, freedom from despair and the fear of death, freedom from all of the brokenness and sorrow that you and I experience in this life. And because our Lord comes to bring freedom, he also comes to bring joy. We rejoice because the Lord has clothed us and dressed us in robes of righteousness. And he makes the comparison that he has planted us like strong, beautiful, mighty oaks as a testament to his power and glory in the world. A digital copy to the worship folder if you'd like to follow along and participate in the service this morning, and we hope that you do as you are comfortable, can be found at the link beneath this video. Pull it up, have it on the screen, or print out a copy for yourself. But most of the words uh, that we'll be speaking back and forth this morning and saying and praying and singing will be up on the screen if you would like again to follow along with us. May the Lord be with you and bless you and your family this morning as he promises to come near to you and to be with you through his word this morning. Long in darkness Israel wandered long in mortal shadows we walked in bondage and self-pity tried in paths of sin and grief in the prophet's words he told us long the god of israel spoke he alone in strength would save us from the hands of all our foes Every valley be exalted Every mountain be made plain Crooked ways repent And straighten all creation Bend in praise Shall raise a mighty Savior born of David's lineage. He comes in covenant love to claim us from our sins to set us free. Bright to those who dwell in darkness, light to those from death who flee. Joy unto the earth. Your pathways dawning peace. Every valley be exalted, every mountain be made plain. Forget ways repent and straighten all creation, bend in praise. Lord and mighty Savior, David's son, and yet his King, morning light of our salvation, of your saving power we sing. Stand, the lame, and dance, ye broken, know the Savior's healing. Oh, 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. Dear friends, one day Christ will come in glory to deliver his people. Therefore, let us prepare our hearts to meet him by humbly seeking God's forgiveness. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep, We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. What God promised long ago through his prophets, he has fulfilled in his Son, Jesus Christ, who came in human flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled God's law. By his innocent death, he paid sin's penalty. By rising from the grave, he opened heaven's door. Christ now comes to you, through the word of his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We light three Advent candles remembering Jesus, the light of the world. He came to defeat the prince of darkness. John proclaimed him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We hear his call to see the light. We confess our sins. And with joy we hear the good news that our sins have been forgiven. We light three Advent candles as a sign of our trust and confidence. Come, Lord Jesus, through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is recorded in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 61. Here the Lord speaks through his prophet, promising to bring good news to his people, good news of freedom, joy, and peace. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm of the day is selected verses from Psalm 71. In this ancient psalm, we ask our Lord to deliver us, to be our rock and our refuge. Please join in reading these words as noted. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Rescue me and deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, to which I can always go, for you are my rock and my fortress. Since my youth, O God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading is recorded in the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5. This is God's will for you in Christ, to be joyful in all circumstances, to pray continually. If that sounds like too much, Paul reminds us the Lord is faithful. And in you and through you, he will do it. Paul writes, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel appointed for the third Sunday in Lent is recorded in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? 
John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, well, we have a vaccine. Finally, some good news in 2020. At least I think it is. Time will tell, I guess. Regardless, it it felt like good news when they announced that shipments would start throughout the U.S. this week, right? I mean, I know some of you, maybe even many of you, have been hoping for, maybe even praying for a vaccine. On the other hand, I, I know others of you who have absolutely no intentions of getting the shot at all. But still, it, it's got to be good news, right? I mean, if for no other reason, the, the vaccine appears to be the thing that everyone is banking on that is going to get us all back to normal, which I think is something we would all agree on, that that's the thing we've been waiting all year to hear. Now imagine that you have been waiting for 70 years. And instead of a pandemic that largely kept you in your home, you and your family were taken from your home, sent off to live as slaves in a foreign country for 70 years. That's how long the people of Judah had been waiting in exile in the foreign nation of Babylon. They were poor, broken-hearted prisoners. They were weak, exhausted, hopeless, and in despair. On the tears they shed. Mourning over everything that they had lost. Mourning over everything that they had been suffering. Mourning over their sin that had caused all of it. Yeah, you could say they were in need of some good news. You know, I couldn't help but make the connection as I was reading through these words this week that a lot of those are the same words that many of you have described yourselves as this past year. Poor, broken-hearted prisoners. Weak, exhausted, hopeless. And the tears you've shed. Mourning over what or even over whom you've lost, mourning over all of the things that you've had to suffer and endure, mourning over your own guilt and your own shame and your own sin, we could use some good news too, couldn't we? And yet I wonder, is the news of the vaccine the good news we've been waiting for? Is that the good news that is going to fix all of our ailments? For 70 years, the people of Judah cried out to their Lord, and as he always does, the Lord heard his people. And so the Lord promises to send them not a king, not a warrior, not an army, but a preacher. A prophet. And this is what he has to say. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Such powerful and beautiful words, and yet 
Here's how Judah translated them. We get to go home. That was the good news that they were waiting to hear for 70 years. Although, when they got there, it wasn't quite as they remembered it. Everything had been destroyed. Everything needed to be rebuilt, most notably the temple. And then there's the fact that about 150 years after they got home, Alexander the Great and his rapidly growing Greek empire and Greek army overtook them. So whatever freedoms they had regained when they got home, they were once again lost. And about 300 years after that, well, then it was the Roman Empire's turn to take over and rule Israel. We get to go home. Thanks for the good news, God. But you see, going back to Jerusalem wasn't really the good news that God was promising His people. And Isaiah wasn't even really the preacher that God was promising to send them. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. That word anointed, in Hebrew, it's the word Messiah. And in the Greek, it's the Christ. The good news God was giving His people wasn't that He was going to send them somewhere, but rather that He was going to send someone to them. A prophet. A preacher. The Christ. The Bible tells us that all of Israel's history is recorded to teach us to teach us what it looks like and what happens when the people of God turn their back on God. To teach us what happens and what it looks like when God's people love themselves and their things more than the God who gives them. And yet what it looks like and what happens when rebellious, selfish people have the kind of God who is hell-bent on saving them anyway. Jesus is the preacher God sends. In fact, Jesus reads and applies these exact words from Isaiah chapter 61. He applies them to himself during his inaugural homecoming sermon at the synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus is the preacher, and He is the one who would come to preach the good news to the poor. But He's not talking about financially poor here. It's not as though we get to say, Oh, God, Lord, I'm poor. You're promising to come and make me wealthy? No. It means, as Jesus would later reference in His Sermon on the Mount, the poor in spirit. Those who confess, as we regularly do at the beginning of our services, I, a poor, miserable sinner. It's to acknowledge what we sing in the hymn, Nothing in my hand I bring. I have nothing that God needs, nothing of value to offer Him, nothing that would ever merit His love. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to Thy cross I cling. And that cross is the good news Christ preaches to the poor, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich, rich with his grace and the eternal riches of heaven. You who are by nature poor in spirit have been made rich in Christ. You who once had nothing to offer to God have now in Christ been given everything from God. Jesus is the preacher who comes to bind up the brokenhearted. Whatever has crushed your heart in 2020, Jesus comes to mend it with His peace. And this is what God's peace, shalom, means. Not just that you're at peace, but the idea of shalom means that you have been made whole. 
whatever it is that weighs on your heart, whatever burdens it carries, Jesus comes to remove them, to replace them with the yoke of His love, which is light and easy, that you might find rest for your soul. Jesus comes to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. So what is it that has enslaved you in 2020? Fear? Your guilt? Bitterness? Rage? Envy? Jealousy? That sin that you just can't forgive yourself for? Jesus comes to tell you, stop. Stop trying to forgive yourself and just simply trust that I, the Lord of lords and judge of all mankind, have already handed down your sentence. You are forgiven. You are innocent because I have paid your penalty and I have suffered your punishment. Your guilt is gone, removed forever, and you are set free. Set free from the pain caused by another. Those words you just can't seem to forgive or forget. That emotionally draining cloud of bitterness that just seems to follow you everywhere. Jesus says you're free from it. The light of Christ's love shines and breaks through every cloud. So stop living in the dungeon of someone else's darkness. The light of God's grace has kicked the doors wide open and broken off your shackles. So stop being held captive by the actions of others and take a hold of your freedom. Bound to Christ's life, death, and resurrection in baptism, you are set free from it all. Free to love and to live in peace. One of my homiletics professors, those are the guys who teach future preachers how to preach, would always emphasize and give us this encouragement that the most important thing to do when you preach, he would say, is to simply hand over the goods. Don't hold them ransom or put a price tag on them. Don't make people think that they need to earn them or work for them. Don't you dare allow someone to leave God's house doubting God's love for them in Christ. As a preacher, you are not a salesman. You are simply called to hand over the goods. So, my dear, poor, broken-hearted prisoner, here are the goods. Here's Jesus. In Christ, you are rich. You are whole. You are healed. You are free. Jesus comes and promises to take everything bad and painful in your life and to one day replace it with something good and beautiful. Instead of ashes, he says, which were a symbol of mourning and even death, he gives you a crown of beauty. Instead of mourning with tears running down your face, he anoints your head with the oil of gladness and now oil runs down your face. Instead of going through life draped in a spirit of despair, he dresses you in a garment of praise. Jesus exchanges all of it. Or, as one of my favorite J.R.R. Tolkien quotes puts it, in the resurrection, everything sad will become untrue. And to that, you and I say, what? I mean, how do you respond to such grace, such mercy, and an exchange of such amazing gifts? Thank you? That doesn't even begin to express it. So how about for this morning, we borrow the words of Isaiah. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness 
As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Isaiah starts to praise God. God's people start to respond with their rejoicing, and yet we can't get even a sentence out before we come back to everything that God has done for us in Christ. And, and here Isaiah doesn't just use one analogy. That's not enough. He's got to use two. The first is to describe how we're dressed. We've been clothed in garments of salvation and robes of righteousness. Our sin is so great that the Bible describes it as covering our whole lives. It hangs off of us like clothing, making us unfit to stand before God. But dressed in Christ, all our torn, tattered, and sinfully stained clothing has been removed, replaced, covered up with His garments of salvation and robes of righteousness, which have been washed and made clean in His blood, so that you and I are now fit, not only to stand before God, but to live with Him forever. The second analogy he uses pictures us like, like little seeds planted by the Lord. On our own, again, we have nothing to offer God, nothing we could produce would, that would be of any value to God, just like on its own a seed is powerless to do anything. A seed needs good soil and water and sunlight if it's ever going to grow. And so the Lord not only plants you, He waters you, He baptizes you, He shines on you, his face shines on you and causes you to grow so that what springs up is something beautiful and precious to God. Through you, he produces righteousness and praise, not just for his own glory, but did you catch how our reading concluded? That the, lo the Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Everyone will see what the Lord graciously does for those who love Him because they will see you. Yeah, we got a vaccine. And that felt like we got some good news this week. I don't know. Time will tell. But here's what I do know. The fact that we got a vaccine is not the best news you received this week. It's not even the best news you received this whole year. And I know that because you have Jesus, the anointed one who comes to preach the good news because he is the good news. And so we delight greatly in the Lord. Our soul rejoices in our God. Amen. Continue with the prayer of the church on the bottom of page 10. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all Christians, that the Lord would keep them from every folly, that would turn them from his word of peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, that the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world 
would richly and daily forgive our sins and the sins of all believers, for all pastors and teachers of God's word, that they would remain faithful and not deny, but confess your truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the children of our families, that every darkness would be lightened by your Son's gracious visitation, and that God would preserve them from dangers to body and soul, guide them by his word in wise paths, and keep them firm in the faith till life's end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our nation and her leaders, that God would preserve our land and citizens in peace and harmony, and protect all who serve in harm's way. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In thanksgiving for the kindness shown to us in Christ, and the certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life with Him, and for those in every circumstance or need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.